Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Breakfast Club after a pretty long hiatus. We'll see if we can remember how to do this. Um, we are back for a very special occasion, which is Shark Awareness Day. And we are here with ichthyology curator Louise Rocha, who is, you know, I hate to say it because it's not good for his ego, but he's a pretty popular Breakfast Club guest. So welcome back, Louise. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Always good yeah. to be here. Um, well, you better show everybody your mug while you're at it, just, just for... Team Sisu forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so today we're going to talk about this is we we're jokingly calling this shark story time with Louise but um, as a member of our scientific dive team and as a coral reef expert and a reef fish expert um, you spend a lot of time around sharks and actually I remember being on expedition with you once and I think I was telling you and Bart Shepard who's the director of our aquarium that I uh, am actually pretty afraid of sharks which I recognize is is not a respectable thing, but is there nonetheless. And you all started, you both started joking about how they were basically like like puppies. Um, and I wanna say like for legal, for like legal reasons, like we are not telling any of you to treat sharks like puppies, but but Louise, you probably get a real sense of, of personality that goes way beyond what people think about when they think about sharks out there, huh? Absolutely, and I think the, their infamy is, is thanks to the, the, the media around them, that's always negative, but... Um... We'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. Yeah, you describe them as as kind of curious and that they might bump you once in a while just to, to kind of see. Yeah, yeah, curious, smart. They definitely have personalities. Each species is different than the other. Some like some things, others like other things, and some don't like some things and others don't like other things. So it's all a matter of, of kind of knowing and recognizing that you're not in your element and, and respecting them as white animals. So you wouldn't go up to a lion and try to pet it right even though it's a just a big cat right so it's the same thing with uh with the sharks i mean when we say they're they're puppy dogs and uh, pup, pup wolves are also puppy dogs so don't don't go near one <laughs> the mother the mother is definitely nearby right um so today is this program is going to be really fun because louise is going to tell us about experiences that he's had in the field but but uh but but also like what's really important to know and the reason Shark Awareness Days exist is because populations of sharks and rays have um, plummeted by 71% over the last 50 years. And today, 77% of those species are actually facing extinction. So um, in addition to spending this week really learning about sharks and learning to appreciate sharks, um, we, are, we have just posted a Facebook fundraiser. Um, and it's, so we're gonna drop a link actually in the, sorry, everybody, you can tell them rusty at the host game but i'm going to drop a link right now in um facebook and youtube so that wherever you're watching you can see that and basically what we're asking for your support with if you can give if not sharing is also great is um to fund mind-changing public exhibits so we can really reshape public perception about sharks and why they're so critical um, scientific research that drives protections of species and of habitats and also we need to fight to protect those species and habitats right now so um, for that reason, we're also splitting half of all donations to this fundraiser with our nonprofit um, Bay Area partner, Shark Stewards, and you can read more about that in the link. So if you can give, thank you so much for that. If not, please stick around and enjoy uh, enjoy the stories we're about to hear anyways. Um, you can ask questions at any time. Just throw them in the comment box on Facebook or the chat box on YouTube, and we'll just ask them as we go along. So Louise, I'm going to give you your presentation right now because you're more interesting than I am. <laughs> All right, Thank take it away. You. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna start by saying that I'm not a shark uh, specialist. I mean, I do, I'm an ichthyologist. I study all fishes, um, but not necessarily sharks, but I did take a lot of classes about sharks and I, I hang out with a lot of shark scientists. I know a lot of them. Um, uh, so please do feel free to ask questions. If I don't know the answer, I'll know somebody that does and I'll point you at least in the right, in the right direction. But having said that, I did have as Laura said, I did have a lot of experiences with sharks. Uh, they come close very often during our dives. And um, it's always nice. It's always exciting for me, um, the opposite of, of being afraid. Uh, when I see one, I try to take pictures. So I have a lot of pictures of sharks that I'm going to share right now. And, um, and hopefully um, bring you some knowledge in this, to me, it's still a gloomy morning in, in San Francisco. Uh, hopefully better weather for you. Um, anyhow, so I wanted to start by showing you this here, which I think about half of you are going to go, oh, how nice, a nice furry mammal, beautiful. 
um, and, 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 and say that that animal right there, the hippopotamus from, from Africa, kills on average 100 times more people per year than sharks do. So sharks on average kill five to 10 people a year. Um, these guys, hippos, they, they kill 500 to 1,000 people a year um, in Africa and nobody hears about it. Everybody thinks they're cuddly and, and nice and warm and, and you wouldn't think twice about approaching one. Um, and I think a lot of it is, is media stigma. And this right here is, it's not my photo. So most of the photos in this, in this presentation are gonna be mine, but except for the, the first few ones and then a few others there, and I'll, I'll mention that. But this one is not my photo. This is simply the first photo that comes up when you Google, when you do a Google image search for hippopotamus, that's what comes up, the first one. And the first one that comes up for sharks is this. So you see the difference there, right? Sharks, even though they are a hundred times less dangerous than, than, than hippos, that's, the first thing that comes up in when you do a Google image search for sharks, it's like the scary, the vicious, the, the gnarly, the, the man eating great white shark. That's the first thing that shows up. And um, I think part of this is because the, the people consume these stories a lot. Um, every time you see sharks in the popular media, it's about attacks. It's about people eat uh, sharks eating things. And when I was, pre it's interesting when I was preparing this, this, talk, I thought, well, I mean, I, I'm going to have to spend, I don't know, 10 minutes looking for bad shark headlines to put in a slide like this. And then when I put, when I Google search for bad shark headlines, a ton of those images come up because the people keep coming across them and keep sharing them. And uh, it's, it's, it's a product, I think, of Hollywood. Um, so these are a number of different weird shark movies that came out in the past, I don't know, 10 or 15 years or so. Just a small selection of them, but every single time the sharks are the villains. Um, Louis, you're missing Sharknado. This feels like a really- I, I do, yeah. So I didn't I didn't put one, this is not a montage that I did. I just I just grabbed this one again, because when you Google shark movie, that's what comes up in, in Google. So this is one image that I, that I got from Google, but there's many, many others. Um, that are invariably the story of the sharks attacking the, the people. Even one that, that features our beloved Bay Area and the, this mega shark eating the Golden Gate Bridge, which seems to be one of the, the preferred targets for um, a lot of, of movies, disaster movies out there. I mean, you see, the, I think the Golden Gate might be the, the number one destroyed landmark in all of the disasters movies in the, in the world. Because every other movie about the earthquakes, about hurricanes about, I don't know, destroying the, the end of the world. You, you always see the Golden Gate being destroyed one way or another. Um, and that's always interesting to, to people that live here. But I think it all started with this guy here. This is the, the famous Jaws movie from the 1970s. And um, uh, we just rewatched it. So I was in a trip with a, a, a shark biologist friend of mine, Yanis Papastomatou. Uh, we just came back from Cocos Island. I'll show a, a picture or two of that trip in a little bit. But we rewatched this movie in uh, uh, during that trip when we were crossing from Cocos back to Costa Rica, and it's it's always fun to watch. And one of, one piece of one of a factoid about the movie that uh, makes a lot of sense that uh, Yoni told me that I did not know about it is that uh, the movie got ten times scarier than what it was supposed to be because of a, 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 a logistical glitch. So the mechanical shark that they used. To, to as as the, the the main character of the movie, uh, Steven Spielberg was never happy with the, how how the shark how the mechanical shark looked, so they filmed the entire first half or three thirds of the movie or with, with, or two thirds of the movie without uh, the mechanical shark. And the result of that was that nobody ever saw the shark until I don't know three thirds two thirds of the way into the movie, and that made the movie much much scarier because there were all those attacks, the first attacks on the on the shark on the movie. And you never saw the shark. You just had to imagine how big and bad and 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 nasty and mean it was. Um, that made the shark the movie much much scarier than uh, than the original, um, just because of this logistical problem of not having the, the shark being believable enough for the um, for the director. Um, so going back to the hippo story, uh, this is just to show you how differently the media treats sharks as opposed to other animals. This is 
a, a, a story about uh, human hippo conflicts. See how human hippo conflicts are exploding in this pristine patch of Kenya. And then the subtitle is like, uh, there's a lot of uh, hungry hippos against hungry fishermen. And this is having deadly results. But like, if you actually read the article, it, it reports 14 human deaths in the last few months in this area in Kenya, because the fishermen are going more and more into the, the hippo territory. 14 deaths, and that's the headline, and that's that's the article. Now, just last week, um, there was a shark attack in Recife, which is a, a town close to my hometown, just um, 100 kilometers south of my, my hometown in Brazil. It is a city that is well known for shark attacks. There's shark attacks there every few months, uh, every year, every other year at least. There hasn't been one in a few years, but there was one just last week. The, the guy's middle name there is Rocha, is my, my, the same as my last name. No relation though, he's not my family, not that I know of. Um, but he died when he walked into one of the, the beaches that are very known for having shark attacks. There's signs about sharks there everywhere. And this is in the international media. It's not even in the local news or just in the local news. It's the international media. And the, the shark is always portrayed as like the last word there as the vicious was the, the person was fatally bitten by the vicious animal. Um, and that was one death and one shark attack in a beach that everybody knows that there are shark attacks. There's signs everywhere saying, don't go in. There's shark attacks here. There's sharks that have been seen and he, he got this guy got drunk, got in to probably dare or his friends dared him to go in. I don't know the full story. I'm just in, in my, using my creative uh, creative rights here. But um, um, the, uh, the, the guy went in and then he was attacked and he was killed by the shark. And um, uh, there was nothing vicious about it. That's what sharks do. I mean, they have their mouth. They use their mouth to bite things. Um, uh, there is a, even a video online, I don't recommend you watch it, but uh, for those that like the, the medical side of things, there is even a video showing that the, the aftermath of the attack is just horrible. Um, yes, it is a horrible event, but it's only like one, two, maybe three, sometimes four or five per year that happens. So there, it's, it's really not funded, founded in, in reality. And Louise, we're getting questions from several people, including Diane C. Um, have you heard about an um, uptick of sharks being born along the California coast and, and then a related uptick in shark bites? I'd, I haven't heard about that, so this is open question. I've heard of really, uh, an uptick of, of sharks being present and being born. I have not heard an uptick about attacks. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the uptick on the more sharks being around is being attributed to climate change because okay. the waters are warming, they're, they're attracting different species, then there's more, uh, there's a growing, growing population. But I have not heard anything about more, uh, more attacks. There's probably definitely more encounters Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't heard anything about more attacks. And I think that would be something that I would hear about, given how much attention the media gives to to attacks, shark attacks. It's just yeah. crazy. And again, it only takes one for it to, to kind of multiply exponentially in people's exactly. minds. And, and it is the things you don't see are actually, as you like with the Jaws anecdote, far scarier than mm -hmm. ones you actually do. The things but, you do. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I wanted to I wanted to follow that up with uh, what actually like ninety nine point nine five percent of the the shark encounters look like in the in the actual world. Um, this is a video that I'm going to show now here about an expedition we did to Saint Paul's Rocks. We have the if you if you want to see the video again, I know it's really quick and then sometimes it doesn't show up uh, nicely on over the internet, but uh, we have this video in in. The Academy's Facebook page. If you search for Six Gill Shark Facebook, you see the you see the video that I'm about to talk about. But this is uh, the, with a video that we made during an expedition to Saint Paul's Rocks. This is an island in the middle of the Atlantic between Brazil and Africa. It's about 500, 600 miles offshore, so way, way out there. Um, the, the only thing in the island is this building there. You can see in the photo. It's a tiny research station for four uh, scientists. And this is the shark we encountered on that particular location. So let me roll play here. Um, so this, the guy that's filming is Mauritius Bell. He stopped, I'm gonna stop here to show you that the, this is his dive computer. Um, so right in the middle there, you can see the depth that we were at. Uh, so if you've seen any of my other talks, you know that we explored those deeper mesophotic coral ecosystems, deeper reefs. 
um, between 200 and 500 feet depth. In this particular dive, we were at 419 feet. I was a little bit deeper than that. I was further down the slope. Maridus was filming and uh, uh, let me play here to, so you can see what happened after this. So that's me down there with my light. I'm trying to get a fish. It was a really good looking fish. Um, and then this looks, this comes up. And if you pay attention, if you, if you can't hear it, you can go back to the, the Academy's Facebook page and search for the six gill video. You can put volume up and hear that. But Maridas is saying, look at the shark, look at the shark. And I'm look, not looking at the shark because I'm, I'm trying to catch this fish. And then Hudson Pinheira, that's the other diver in the, in, in the dive there. The shark goes right above his head. So the, now you can see how big the shark is, right? So that's um, that's Hudson on the bottom there. The shark is about know, twice the size of him, and he's he's a big he's a big dude. He's like six one, six two, something like that. Uh, so it was a big shark. It went right above our heads. I'm gonna role play here again. That I want to point something out. Um, I'm gonna stop here. Um, it went right above our heads, and uh, um, neither one of us saw it. Neither Hudson or I saw the shark. Uh, so that's how 99.9% .9 of the shark encounters go if you're a diver. Um, the sharks are gonna see you, they're gonna be right where you are and you're not gonna see them. Um, I, many, many, we have many anecdotes, many stories about that. Yoni has a good one that uh, they were, he was diving with uh, um, one of our colleagues, Carl, in the Northwest Nine Islands and there was a tiger shark circling around and everybody saw it except for the two guys that were the shark specialists in the dive. Um, so in the most, I mean, nine out of 10 times, if you are in the water, sharks are going to see you and you're not going to see them and nothing happens and they don't attack anybody. They just swim out and go away. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out to you in this video that I will come back to towards the end of the talk to is the fact that even though this was at 430 feet, this shark probably has never been seen by any person. Um, because it's a shark that lives in deep water, especially in this, in this, uh, um, location in St. Paul's Rocks in Brazil, which is really warm water in the surface. And this species doesn't like warm water, so it stays down where the water is cold. But there is, if you look closely, there's a fishing line attached to its mouth. So uh, it's already signs of human impact in a shark that nobody ever seen, probably. Um, so sometimes you don't see the sharks, but sometimes you do see the sharks. So in this, this uh, was probably my closest encounter with a shark. Uh, I was using a very wide angle lens on this on this dive where I was diving again with Yoni. I mean, Yoni is going to come up in this talk in many, many times. I was diving with him in uh, Hawaii. We're looking at uh, uh, studies on, on fish telemetry. He, he looks at, he studies shark telemetry, which we'll talk about in a little bit more too. Uh, but we were going, re uh, recover the retrievers and there was a lot of sharks around. And this one particularly came in and it touched the nose against the, the dome port of my of my lens of my camera. So it was really, really close. And those are the ones that I told Laurel that kind of behave like puppy dogs. They they circle you around, they come and look and then they they touch you and then when when it starts getting uncomfortable, that's when we get out of the water. But you have to recognize that it is time to get out of water. Otherwise you 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 get in trouble. Um and again you don't get in trouble because they're vicious, but you're getting trouble because they're curious and they're in their own element. So you have to respect that we're visitors and they are the, the owners. Louise, so, Sarah yeah. asked <clears throat> whether if sharks are territorial about actual territory or just about personal space. Some species are territorial about actual territory. Um, uh, gray reef sharks, I think, are more territorial than others. Um, but most of them, I would say, is more about personal space. And when they start getting close, uncomfortably close, it's because they're trying to, they're, they're curious, and then people don't recognize that as curiosity. But when, when you're invading their territory, a lot of them, um, they, they, they signal that they don't like you. So there's a behavior, they, they change the behavior, they lower their pectoral fins, and they kind of hunch their backs, and, and they swim really quickly. Um, if you're experienced in the water, you know how to recognize the behavior immediately and you kind of change what you're doing somehow to, to not make them mad anymore. Mm -hmm. But and even at that point, they just they want you to vacate the premises not to yeah. do anything else. So you just. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. It's a warning more than anything else. Um, so I, I work on coral reefs. I see a lot of 
sharks on uh, coral reefs. This is a, a white tip, uh, white tip shark. It's one of the most common sharks you're gonna see on coral reefs. I saw this one in Fiji. Um, it was a really nice coral reef and there were a lot of those white tips and it was probably because it was in a place where they, they fed the sharks to uh, um, attract more sharks and then dive with the sharks. So there's quite a few places like that around the, the tropics, um, locations that are known for to attract sharks so that the divers can dive with the sharks and see the sharks. I'm not entirely in favor of that practice because it kind of changes their behavior. They expect to be fed every day. And uh, if you go and dive in these places and there's no food, they're gonna get mad too because there's no food. So that it's an invitation to a potential um, negative encounter. Um, they do this in, in different ways in, in Fiji and in the Bahamas, they people dive outside of cages, which is what happened in this particular case in Fiji, in Fiji here. In Hawaii, there's a place you can go in the North shore that you dive inside the cage. Although if you can see from there, I, I was outside of the cage taking the picture, um, but the, the sharks were perfectly fine, but the tourists were all inside the cage and, and there was chum in the water. So the boat was dropping up food and that what was attracting the sharks and, um, and uh, there was 10 or 15 sharks around that dive, just circling the cage and trying to grab, get some scraps from the, the boat that was dropping the food. And again, conditioning the sharks to expect food from humans or from boats, which kind of provokes in negative encounters um, sometimes. Um, it, it has its positives. So these kinds of shark dives, they have their positive side too, because they provide income uh, and they provide a value for the shark being alive. So every now and then you see a headline that says that the shark alive is worth $2 million and that it's worth, worth $50. Um, and and, and, and uh, Louise, and, sorry, that's an yeah. individual shark. So the value of an the individual, individual shark, shark to tourism is $2 million? Yeah, in some places, yes, because you keep going back to the same place to, to see the same shark and, right. and uh, it attracts a lot of people. So there's a lot of different dive operators and diving is an expensive activity. Um, especially when it's something specific like shark diving. Um, uh, you sometimes spend the whole day there and um, um, a lot of people do it. So um, over the, the course of a few years, a, shark, a living shark becomes very valuable, but it becomes valuable to a different community. It becomes valuable to the dive shop, not to the fisherman. So if it's worth $100 to the fisherman, it's still worth $100 to the fisherman. So you can't quite go to the fisherman and say, hey, you can't fish that shark because it's worth $2 million if the fisherman is not getting in, in a single piece of those $2 million. So um, uh, you, you, we have to be aware of those kind of silver bullet solutions that don't look at all sections of, uh, of society and, and especially ignoring the local communities that depend on, on fishing for other, other means. We kind of have to involve everybody in the, in the solutions. Um, this one is a gray reef shark, so it's one of those that um, uh, has the, the the clear behavior changes when they know they're they're being uh, uh, something in is in their their environment and it, they don't want it. I think it's one of the few sharks that I had uh, like negative encounters with. Um, I was diving with them, or not with them. I was diving to collect fish from my research in uh, coco skilling in in. Australia, off of Australia in the Indian Ocean. And uh, there were a lot of gray reef sharks there and they were very curious and there was not a lot of diving there, which made them even more it bolder towards us. They were really getting really close to us and I was, I was catching fish and putting them in a, in a bag uh, to uh, uh, bring them back for analysis. So I had a bag full of, of dead fish, which would be equivalent to someone, I don't know, spear fishing somewhere. And the sharks were getting really, really close to a point that I had to get out of the water. It's either getting out of the water or giving them my fish. So I didn't, I didn't want to give them my fish, so I got out of the water. But there's people that try to stay in the water and defend their fish and keep fishing and push the shark away. And that's when, when bad things happen. So you have to recognize what they want you to do, which in this case was to give them the fish. And if you don't want to give them the fish, you get out of the water. <laughs> They so thought you packed you, a lunch for them. They were like, thank exactly, you. Exactly. So. <laughs> right, right, right. So when you get out of the water, um, the, the problems stop. And, and I wanted to give you an example of another dive that the same, a very similar thing happened. And uh, we couldn't get out of the water. <laughs> 
So this was uh, during a dive we did at the Bahamas with our whole team doing that same deep diving that we do. And um, for when we go to 400, 500 feet, uh, uh, there's a lot of gas that gets dissolved into our tissue. So we can't go straight up back to the surface. We have to decompress. And decompression, when you're diving, decompression simply means that you have to stop every, at, in 10 foot intervals and then you spend time there for the, the gases that got dissolved into your, into your tissues to dissolve back, to make, come back into solution and be eliminated uh, very slowly. Otherwise, it would be like trying to open a, a soda bottle after you shake it and then everything turns into bubbles and you don't want bubbles circulating in your bloodstream. So to avoid that, we come up very slowly. It takes hours and we can't come up any quicker than that. Um, if we do, the bubbles go into solution and it's, it's bad. So during the compression in a dive we did at the Bahamas, the mission of this particular dive was to uh, uh, collect lionfish. So lionfish is a fish that uh, uh, is, is very problematic. It's a very beautiful fish. Um, it's nat native to the Indo-Pacific and it was introduced by humans to the Caribbean. So it's causing all kinds of trouble in the Caribbean because it's not a fish that's native to the area and it's a, a predator that it's, it's eating a lot of the native fish. So one of the things we want to know about them is uh, what they're eating. So we were collecting them at those deep reefs. We had no idea what they were eating at the deep reefs. And as we were coming up, those Caribbean reef sharks, they started circling us and circling us and they really wanted the lionfish. They really wanted the lionfish and we couldn't come up. So what we did was we gave them the lionfish. <laughs> And uh, the minute we gave them the lionfish, they ate the lionfish and they took off. And we never saw them again during the whole dive. We spent another two hours so the, for the, the, the first. So they showed up and they spent about an hour circling us and circling and getting closer and circling and getting closer and circling and getting closer. And then we finally decided, all right, let's give them the lionfish. So we gave them the lionfish, they ate the lionfish and they disappeared. And for the next two hours, we didn't see a single one of them. Um, so that's what exactly what they wanted. We gave them what they wanted, they took off. If we hadn't given them and we stayed another two hours in the water, they'll probably get uncomfortably close and try to get the lionfish by force. Um, so, but we didn't have to get to that. We just gave them what they wanted. Um, this is a picture that I took in the last, the last trip that I did with, with Yanni to Cocos in Costa Rica. And it was, was one of the most amazing trips I've ever done. We only did shallow diving there, but it was incredible because Cocos is a, a very a well uh, monitored protected area. There is um, a lot of fish there. There's a lot of sharks because it's protected and there's no fishing allowed. Um, it's very well managed. Um, and uh, there's a big, it's known for big aggregations of hammerheads. We did not see the big aggregations of hammerheads, but we did see this, which I thought was really interesting. So if you look closely to that picture, uh, the two butterfly fish that are on the side of the of the um, uh, hammerhead shark there, they're cleaning the hammerhead. So that's a female hammerhead shark. The, those brown patches on the side are, are markings of mating mating scars. So when they mate, the male bites the side of the, it's, it's gruesome, the male bites the side of the female so that it, it's firmly attached to it and then they mate. So, but the result of that is that they have on the shoulders, they have the, the, the mating scars. And then when they have that, they come close to the reef and the butterfly fish, they go there and they, they bite off the, the scar tissue and the, they, they clean it up for them. So it's a really good service for the, the hammerhead sharks. And they're constantly coming and visit those cleaning stations, something that I have seen videos and, and photos of before, but I never, uh, I've never seen it in person. So it was really nice to see that. Hey, Louise. Um, I have a hammerhead related question that came in earlier, but now seems like a good time. This is from Andrea, yeah. Andrea, age eight. Um, and she asks, why are hammerheads shaped like that? And can they open their mouths far? They can. They can open their mouths far. They, every shark, they can project their mouth out. So they have the, the mouths, the, the jaws are kind of almost detached from the rest of the uh, the rest of the skeleton but uh, they they have a, a hinge that they can kind of project their jaws out down and out so they can project them out hammerheads um it is the most accepted hypothesis right now to explain the shape of their heads is because they, it gives them it, it gives them a couple of different advantages one so if you heard about the the, the sensory system of sharks they have this very advanced sensory system that uh, uh, allows them to sense electrical fields in other animals. So they have Ampole of Lorenzini. It's a, a, a cell system 
especially concentrated around their noses, that makes them, them their noses very sensible to electrical fields in other organisms. So they can sense the, the electrical, every, every biological body produces electricity. It's a tiny amount of it. You can't shock anybody if you touch them, but there is electricity there. If you had an instrument to measure it, you can measure it. Oh, that's what an electrocardiogram does. Um, but the sharks can sense that because of that very, uh, uh, very uh, well-developed system. And it's all concentrated in the nose. So if they have a big nose like the, the hermitheads do, they have even more space for those electric sensory systems. And their system is, is even better than every other shark out there um, to the point where they can locate. So if they swim above the sand on a coral reef, very close to the, to the sand, they can locate fish that are buried under the sand and then dig them out and eat them. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why they have these, these really big, the big nose head shape because they have those more of those sensing systems. Um, for other ones like the giant hammerhead that has a similar shaped head, they use it to pin down their prey. So they, they eat stingrays a lot and they pin down the stingray with the big head and then they kind of protrude their jaw the way I said and then they bite them and then they, 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 they get their meal. Wow. Um, this is following up on that question from Mary Jo. She asks if the jaws, the jaws that kind of are, that will detach a bit or lower, asks mm -hmm. if that's like the jaws in eels and wants to know if there is an evolutionary relationship there. Very similar. Yes. So a lot of fish, they have those protrusible jaws. Mm -hmm. um, some groups of fish have more than others, but a lot of fish, they evolve it dependent, independently sometimes and also every fish has the potential to do it because they share the, they share the trait. But in some, some species it's fixed, but in a lot of fish, they can protrude, protrude it out and, and, and suck things. There's wrasses that are famous for doing that. So there's this link jaw wrass that's a really famous and popular one that they protrude the whole jaw and it becomes like almost a sling jaw that comes out, I don't know, almost halfway out from the body. And then it sucks in a lot of things. So it's a really wow. good system. If you search, the, the, the actual term for it is protrusible jaw. And if you search on YouTube, there's a lot of videos that some that even show the shark protruding it. Yeah. Wow. Okay, cool. And that I should say too, that if you're really interested specifically in hammerheads, um, we have on Monday, we have uh, Jasmine Graham from the Moat Marine Laboratory, who's going to come and talk about um, hammerhead phylogeny, so like evolution, and should be really nice. interesting. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Go on. Yeah. So um, this is I've seen my share of tiger sharks around, but this is I, the only photo I have of them. Most of the times that I saw them, I didn't have a, a camera in my hand by for some some reason. This was a dive that I did again with Yanni. I mean, every time I see sharks, it's with Yanni. But it's mostly because I don't, I don't do shark research. So sometimes I go and, and dive with my shark colleagues, and they always take me to places where there's sharks. Uh, so we saw this big, massive tiger shark. And again, how big was it, Louis? Just for some this one was about, I think, 10, 12 feet. So yeah. it's not a fully grown one, um, and it still has the pattern. So when they, when they really adults, they, they get more striped. This one has more spots and it's like a, a pattern between juvenile and adult so it was about 10 12 feet long which is still a big shark but they grow mm -hmm. to like 18 19 <laughs> feet almost as big as a great whites i have a picture of a much bigger one far ahead a little bit um yeah but this one also we saw it in that shark tagging uh place and i wanted to to talk a little bit about tagging which is a research that uh yanni does uh so um Huh. I thought he was in this picture, but he's not. He's in, he was in the boat, but these are all um, mostly not shark people. The, the guy in the center there, Carl Meyer, is the, the shark biologist that was on board. And we did a lot of work doing this in Hawaii, in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, um, tagging sharks using multiple different types of tags. One type of tag, the one that we put on this particular shark here, this was a, I think it was a Galapagos shark. I can't quite tell from the photo if it's a Galapagos or a Silky. They're very similar, but uh, I think this one was a Galapagos. So we kind of, we open, we do an, inc an incision on the belly and then we, we insert a, a, a little uh, acoustic tag. So it's a tag that pings a, an acoustic signal that is recorded by a, a receiver. And that's the receiver here in the next picture. Um, 
and uh, the receiver is what I was diving with Yanni. So this is the dive where you saw the tiger shark. I was diving with Yanni to recover. So these retrievers, which is the thing in the, attached to that rope there, they stay in the water for six months to a year, depending on what the receiver is. And they record the acoustic signal that's transmitted by the, by the tag, but only if the shark comes close to the receiver. So in a lot of places, uh, researchers like Yanni, they put networks of those receivers every few miles um, and then they can tell which shark was close to which receiver when when they download the data and they can do those maps of movements the sharks moving between one receiver to another which is a really efficient way of studying sharks that live close to shore I mean you can't really put a vast network of this in, in a in big area in the Pacific so you need different ways of, of studying sharks that move much more than than the coastal zone so this is a really good way to study sharks in the coastal zone uh, we also put other types of tags. This one, uh, uh, Carl's is, Carl, I think it's, that's Carl. Yeah, he's inserting the tag uh, on the, close to the dorsal fin of the, the, I think it's the same Galapagos shark there. It's just a number tag that we put in the shark. And then we put our phone number there and all of the information about where to mail the, ta the tag back. And in hoping that if somebody fishes this shark or if it dies and washes up somewhere, we get the tag. And then we get more information about how and when and where it, it moved. For sharks like the tiger shark, so this is a fully grown tiger shark. It's about 17 feet long. It's, so it's almost as long as the boat we're on. Um, so for tiger sharks and great whites and things that move thousands of miles in the ocean, we use satellite tags. It's a different type of tag. Um, that instead of doing the, the acoustic signal that is picked up by the receiver, um, it transmits data to the satellite. Um, every time the shark goes out of the water with the fin up or a few, so it, it stays attached to the shark for a few months. And then that, that tag, it, retrie it collects information about where the shark is in terms of water temperature and water depth. And um, and uh, and then when it comes up to the surface, then it transmits the, not only the data, but also the position of where the shark is. But if we know the depth and the temperature, we have a really good idea of where in the ocean the shark is. The, sh the, the ocean is so well stratified in terms of temperature and depth that uh, if we know it's like at 200 meters and the temperature of the water is 12 degrees Celsius, we know more or less where the shark is in the world in terms of big ocean basin. So cool. Um, so I wanted to shift a little bit. These are still my photos. I wanted to shift a little bit to shark biology here because I want to get into conservation at some point. Um, but um, uh, this one is, uh, it's a silky shark, I think. And I mean, you can tell I'm not a shark specialist because I can't, for some species, it's it really easy. Tiger shark is super easy to identify, but silkies and Galapagos, and there's a lot of sharks that kind of look like this. It's the classic shark, shark, shark shape. Um, and not, not many distinctive features. It's not a white tip, it's not a black tip. So there's a lot of sharks that kind of look like that and they're hard to, to tell, to differentiate. But there is one thing that you can see in, on, in, in every shark and that's circled there by that. I don't know if you can see it, or this white circle that came up. So that's uh, indicating the clasper. That's the reproductive organ of male sharks. So you can kind of tell which male, which is male and female. And that's an aspect of uh, uh, shark biology that makes them more vulnerable to overfishing and to overexploitation and to human threats in general. So that's a male, that's a female right here, and it doesn't have the clasper. So again, the circle is pointing the same area there behind the, the ventral fin. Um, it's either a, a, a female that had just had a big meal. So it's much rounder than the other, the, the previous guy there. So she either just had a big meal or it's pregnant. Um, but uh, they get pregnant. So that's the big difference between sharks and most other fish. So in most fish, females in general, in a few fish they do, but in most fish, they don't get pregnant. They, the females, they produce eggs, but then they release the eggs in the, in the water column and then the males release the sperm and then it's external fertilization. And uh, it's usually millions of, of tiny little fish produced by, by uh, tunas, for example, or a lot of the other bony fishes out there. Sharks are different. They, they mate uh, and the females get pregnant and it's only a few pups at a time. Uh, depending on what species it is, it's, uh, I don't know, 10, 12, 20, 25. It's very few species have more than 30 pups at a time. 
and they have a gestation period just like we do um for us it's nine months for them it can be between i don't know a few months to all the way up to years there's some species that have the gestation period of years so the combination of have the gestation period and having just a few pups at a time is that it's really easy for humans to overfish them because they don't redo they don't re uh, they don't refresh their population often enough and that is a strategy it's a biological strategy that works for them because they're top predators so they don't want to have a million sharks in a reef because there's not going to be enough food for them so they always biologically it's always advantageous for the sharks to have a small population so that they have plenty of prey but the result is that by having a small population it's easy to overfish um I'm going to tell you a little story about, I mean, one of the first papers I published when I came to the academy that has to do with, uh, with, uh, with shark biology, and it's, it's one of the few shark papers I published. So when I came here, I think the month I got here, back in 2011, there was a mystery about these leopard sharks. They, uh, we had three females in the tank, and they always lay eggs, but because there were no males around, the, the, the eggs would never develop into babies. And then... When I got here, one of the females laid eggs and the eggs developed into babies and everybody was stunned because there were three females. So how's that possible? Um, so there were reports uh, before of uh, uh, females either cloning themselves, which is a strategy that some of the uh, some of sharks use. They sometimes they clone themselves. Uh, the females just produce clones of themselves. Um, sometimes because the, the shark populations naturally are small, it's hard sometimes to find a mate a male to mate with. So one of the strategies that, that sharks have to uh, uh, perpetuate, to keep their populations going is by cloning themselves. The other uh, way they can do that is by storing sperm. So when they mate once, the female has a specialized gland that she can save the sperm for future matings. But these females here at the academy, they had been by themselves for almost five years and there was never been any reported case of sperm storage that long before. So we did the genetic tests of the, the, the pups that were born, fully expecting that they were clones. So it's really easy to determine that genetically. You just get a little genetic sample of the mother, and then you get a genetic sample of the baby. And if they're 100% identical, they're clones. Um, and we did the tests, and to our surprise, they were not clones. They were actually the product of sperm storage. So in the aquarium, they were before coming to the academy. Uh, they mated. And the, the females stored the sperm for that long, for like five years, the sperm was still viable with no liquid nitrogen, no big <laughs> human uh, influence or anything. Um, and, and they still produced um, viable pups that far in, in, in advance. So it's a beautiful evolutionary strategy they have to keep the populations going, even when they don't have mates around. That's amazing. I, I honestly have never, I wasn't aware of the cloning strategy. Does that literally... So they so they're able to just basically give birth to a copy, genetic copy of themselves without yep. it being. We think of eggs as needing to be fertilized and and going through this process. That's a that's astounding. Yeah, wow. yeah, it's amazing, and there's it's documented in quite a few species. So yeah, something else that um, a few people don't know about is that when they think of sharks, they only think of great whites and men eating sharks. But there's 500 species of shark out there, 400 plus. I mean, they keep being described every every few months or so there's a new one that pops up, especially from the deep sea. So the diversity of sites is, is really big and the diversity of biological strategies they use is really big. There's something else, see tiger sharks and the, I think bow sharks, they have a, a, a strategy that's called intrauterine cannibalism. So the pups, when they're, yeah, when they're growing inside the mom's uterus, they eat each other. So initially the, the female produces, I don't know, 20 or 30 pups. And then the bigger one starts eating the little ones. And then when it's time to get to give birth, there's only two or three that are actually born. Yeah. And, yeah, and they that eat them themselves. It doesn't seem fair. It seems like survival of the fittest should at least not start till after you're actually born. Right, <laughs> like, right, right, so. right, right. Yeah, but in, in that's this is used to kind of villainize sharks. They're so mean that they eat each other oh, inside yeah. the uterus. But birds do that too. I mean, birds, they... They, they push each other off nests, the, the little birds, so that they can get more food. And right. then sometimes, yeah, females lay four or five eggs and only one is, is viable in the end because either they eat each other or they kill each other or they 
push each other off. I don't like birds. They're, they look yeah. too much like dinosaurs. <laughs> I mean, and, but it's a really good strategy for the health and, you know, robustness of the overall population, right? It's amazing. Yeah. 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 If you're giving birth to just a few pups, making sure that they're, they're really fit and they can yeah. come out and then start hunting from the get-go and being big, healthy, successful hunters, even when they're pups, it, it's a really good strategy. Yeah. 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 So that brings us to conservation. Um, sharks are very threatened as laura said in the beginning over 70 percent of the populations in the open ocean are, are threatened one way or another some more than others um and it's we are mostly the culprits um the biggest threats right now are overfishing and uh and directive uh, either directly or indirectly so there's fisheries that target sharks specifically there are uh but they're also caught in in incidentally in other fisheries so the tuna fisheries, for example, it's called tuna fisheries, but uh, in, in many, many cases, they, caught, they catch more sharks than they do tunas uh, because it's the same method. The method that they use to catch tuna is also a very effective method to catch sharks. If they're using a long line, for example, it catches more sharks than it does tuna. If they're, they're targeting a school of tuna with a net, then it's more tuna than sharks. But with the hook and line thing, I mean, it's a lot of sharks that get caught. And then um, there's a lot of sharks, for example, that live on coral reefs. And if you have been paying attention to environmental news lately, coral reefs are threatened by worldwide by climate change. Uh, their the health of coral reefs are declining. And with that, the health of fish populations decline. And with that, the health of shark population that depend on, on reefs decline. Um, so sharks are in trouble everywhere. This is not, um, I couldn't find an updated graph with the numbers that uh, Laura was talking about because that paper came out really recently, I think less than six months ago. Um, but even this is from five years ago. So five years ago, over a quarter of all species of shark and rays, they were threatened one way or another um, and classified as threatened by, uh, by the UCN. So they are really in really, really a big, big trouble. And, and one of the reasons for that, sadly enough, I mean, it's it's always to do with us, right? But one of the reasons, one of the stupidest reasons, I think, is this one, is shark fin. Somehow, it's and it's not even for nutrition, but somehow people got this idea that eating shark fin soup is, is uh, some sort of social status, gives you some sort of social status or... or, or is is good for you in some way but it's 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 not it's not even nutritious it's just cartilage and but uh, when you when you think about their reproductive strategy how hard it is to get them uh, uh to replenish their own populations if you start taking them out too many of them and how easy it is to over exploit them even when especially when you target things that are for example only fins um, which is the case here and the case that, that a lot of, of people do. It's, it's super easy to go out on a boat and, and kill thousands of sharks and not even need to, to bring a freezer on a boat, for example. So if you go out to fish tuna or any other fish, you have to bring a freezer. You have to put the whole tuna in there. And then and the, the, the size of the boat limits the number of tuna you can catch. If your target is only shark fins, you don't even need refrigeration because they have to be dried to put be put in the soup anyway. So you can catch thousands of fish, thousands of sharks in a tiny small fish with very little effort. And that makes it really easy to over exploit and kill like millions of them, which we do. Um, so I had this as, as my last slide, the shark fin soup one, but I didn't want to leave you with a, a depressing message. So I'm going to switch that to a, a, an optimistic one that will start depressing, but will become optimistic, I promise. Um, so this is, this is Castle Bravo. This is the largest atomic test ever done on planet Earth. This was, a, 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 I can't remember, I think it was a thousand times more powerful than Hiroshima. That was the last test that they did in Bikini Atoll. And they stopped doing tests after that because they thought, well, I mean, we can probably destroy the planet if we're doing that, if we keep doing that. But it was in the 1950s in um, um, Bikini Atoll. It was a, a thousand times more powerful than Hiroshima. And they were, they were thinking it's gonna, it was gonna be 10 times more powerful than Hiroshima. So it, it surprised everybody. Um, it destroyed a lot of coral reefs in the island, needless to say. It left a huge crater behind. So that's the, the crater there. Um, that's uh, the Bravo crater, this, this big... Um, 
this big circle right in the middle. And the yellow arrow is arrows pointing to a place that I dove in. Uh, it was in 2006, so almost 50 years, almost exactly 50 years after the explosion that created that huge crater. That, that huge crater is almost two miles wide, though. It's a big, big crater. To give you an idea that 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 of the power of uh, the power of this the, the, this explosion, um, there was fallout, radioactive fallout. So there was pulverized coral reef and sand that rained on islands that were over a hundred miles away from this spot. That's how powerful the whole blast was. Um, now, because of there's so many, so much atomic testing in Bikini, after the tests ceased, nobody could come back to the island. Um, so there's still today, still today, there's only a very limited number of people in the island. I think it's only 10 or 15 people. And they can only stay in the island for six months and then they have to come out. They can't stay there for long term. And then they rotate people in and out. Um, because of the effects of the lingering effects of radiation. So I dove on that uh, spot there on the yellow on the yellow arrow, and uh, I saw one of the healthiest reefs with one of the healthiest shark populations I have ever seen in my life. Um, and I've been around. I dove a lot. Um, and uh, and uh, it just comes to tell you that even the largest man-made nuclear explosion ever done on planet Earth, you can't completely destroy them. If you give them a chance, they'll come back. Um, if you stop fishing them, they'll come back. The, the, the reef will become healthy again. And with that, the, the shark populations will become healthy again. Um, and that is what I wanted to end with. And I'll be glad to answer more questions. Yeah. And even if, you know, obviously we can't completely stay away from many areas on Earth, but but the point is that if we can offer some degree of protection, then there is the, there is actually hope that that things can ecosystems can rebound, um, and that's Absolutely. what so much of your hope for reefs research about is is what so much of your hope for reefs research is about. Which is um, we can drop some other links for folks who aren't familiar with that. But um, right. I wanted to ask a this is a very specific question from Helen, and this came in just after the hammerhead bit. Um, she was fascinated by the fact that they eat these stingrays and wondered um, whether they by chance have a thicker belly skin to protect them from stingers. Huh. I don't know. I don't know if um, I don't know if there's any research done on that. I don't yeah. know if there's a comparative between but I, I, I suspect they do, because one of the reasons why they they even discovered that um, the they stingrays is a big part of their diet is because they find them when they when they catch the big hammerheads, they find the stings of the rays under their mouth and on oh. their, their belly area because they get stung, but they, it doesn't, doesn't seem to bother them because they keep coming back for the same meal over and over again. Right. And in their mouths and they find stings in various places of the shark. <laughs> Yeah, and that you said that was just the giant hammerheads, is that right? Yeah, the giant hammerhead is the the one that focuses on on rays. The yeah. the scallop one, which is the one that I showed the photo of, I think they they focus more on on fish that are buried. They eat the occasional stingray too, but it's not the main okay. the main diet, I don't think. Well, Helen, I'm very impressed by your question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I'll end as we come up on the hour here. I'll end with one that several students from one of the classrooms watching asked, which was, "Do you have a favorite shark?" I do. I do have a favorite shark, and it's the one that I couldn't take a picture of. Um, so I think I told you this story before, right, Laura? It's, I yeah. think one of the most memorable shark sites I've ever I've ever had. Um, I was diving in the Philippines. I think it might have been in the trip that you were there. It was with yeah. <laughs> Bart and Hudson. Yeah, we did a like this beautiful dive to like 300 feet, 350 feet, um, and we were when we were coming up, um, looking up on the ledge. There was these two very large thresher sharks that swam by and just mm. came and came really close and said hello to us in their own way and then just took off. But none of us had a camera. I didn't have a camera. Hudson didn't have a camera. Bart didn't have a camera. So we, we saw their silhouettes, most like uh, what we're seeing here in the in, the, in this photo. Um, but uh, nobody nobody took any pictures of them because we didn't have cameras. So it's one of those images that's going to be etched in my memory forever, but not. Uh, no images to to share sorry yeah. but it's the treasure shark so if you google treasure shark you see that it's that one that has the really long tail 
Yeah. And they use the tail sometimes to disorient the prey. It's a beautiful, beautiful shark. Yeah, That's like my extraordinary tails, like just so, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, thank you. And before we let folks go, I wanna take one more chance to just say if you've, if you've enjoyed learning about sharks and um, want to help uh, support our work to protect them, um, we are doing a fundraiser right now. I'm gonna drop a link in, it's on Facebook. Um, and we are raising money for our reefs research that helps to protect these critical habitats. And then we're splitting donations with our nonprofit partner, Shark Stewards. Um, so please do, you know, every every dollar helps and or just sharing it also helps as well. But thank you all so much. Please come back tomorrow at the same time. We're gonna talk to David McGuire from Shark Stewards. And um, Louise, thank you for, for being here and regaling us with stories and photos once again. Um, and we'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Always glad to be here. Thanks, everybody. Bye. <laughs>